Awesome. So to kick it off, first one's for Patrick. So Patrick, is 4K now table stakes for achieving a great picture with projectors? And is it a good time to upgrade to 4K if you have a 1080p projector? Yes, and my answer is threefold. First of all, there's amazing 4K con HDR content that's being generated all the time now. With companies like Kaleidoscape that are gonna give you this content readily available at your fingertips, you can watch almost anything that you want at home. That's, that to me is the most important one. The second one is screens are getting bigger, especially in the projection realm, you're getting bigger and bigger and bigger. We need that extra resolution to be able to define the image and make it look better. If we had a 140 inch 1080, it might look okay, but if we have a 160 inch, you're probably stretching a little bit. Mm -hmm. Awesome, anybody else wanna to touch on that one? Good, cool, awesome, we'll move on. So uh, next one's for Cody, kind of going down the line here. Uh, how important is HDR when looking at a television or projector-based theater system? Uh, honestly, it's probably one of the more important things after the introduction of color. <laughs> because <laughs> HDR is basically, I mean, it's high dynamic range. It, it, it increases the amount of contrast that you can see in a picture. And what that really means is we've all watched movies and somebody's standing next to, let's say, a window, and you can't really see what's going on outside the window because it's just too bright, right? You can see their face, but you can't see them. Or you can see out the window, but you can't see the face because it's too dark. Well, what does HDR do? It actually balances all that out. You get more contrast so you can see out the window and you can see that person's face. And so you just get more. And honestly, I don't think it's just good for us. It's also good for the industry in general, right? When you have a camera that can do that, being somebody that has to deal with lighting and doing videos, it's like, it takes so much work to get the lighting right. But if your camera can already record in HDR, you don't have to worry about the window being blown out or being able to see the person's face. It makes the production a lot easier as well. And so then we can see that at home and just appreciate it. Because like I said before, you know, going to a theater, having a theater experience is lifelike because you have that reflected image. So the more lifelike the picture can be with HDR, being able to see more, it's just, it's just better. So personally, I think it's probably just behind color. Oh, I know, I agree. I think with like the new Batman coming out, it showed me, I think movies are just getting darker and darker. Yeah, so if yeah. you don't have HDR, you may not enjoy the new Batman movies. Sorry, guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So. I'm uh, jumping in on that. Yeah. Uh, in my experience working with, uh, at Christie and, and working uh, with Dolby, uh, to launch their Dolby Cinema Initiative, HDR was at the core of their mission statement because they really wanted to bring something that differentiated their experience from what IMAX had been bringing. Mm -hmm. And so at Christie, we worked with Dolby to develop specially designed projection systems that provided the HDR um, uh, capability and then working with the studios they provided the content that went ahead and allowed for those projection systems to be enriched and for obviously for all the moviegoers to really enjoy that um, and it was a huge success and obviously now that HDR is now pretty prevalent now not only from in the commercial cinema marketplace but now for home theater so yeah, I think one thing that's great is that you know audio advice has provided a great opportunity for those of you to kind of see what HDR can look like in a home theater environment on a projector. We've got some great representatives here, Sony, JVC, we've got Wolf, you know, you've worked with Christy, some amazing manufacturers that can give you a really, really beautiful image. It's amazing how some people will come over to my home theater and they don't realize like, they didn't think that you could get a beautiful image on a projector because they're thinking what they saw 10 years ago. You know, and technology has just changed so much. So we're getting great HDR, we're getting vibrant colors, we're getting great uh, black levels. And so it just provides a really incredible uh, image. And that's why you guys are here because you have projectors or maybe you're interested in a projection system. Yeah. And Everyone, at Kaleidoscape, I'm sorry, Nick, at Kaleidoscape, you know, we continue to add more and more titles in HDR. Yeah. Now the studios are providing us with the mezzanine files that have that, and we just keep adding and adding that, and so making the library even richer for everybody. And, and just to add to that real quick, um, it's amazing, all the, along with HDR, we usually are now getting Atmos, so it's important that we keep them in mind, like uh, being able to get that 4K HDR in Atmos, uh, I remember yeah. like five, six years ago, people were wondering like, well, do I really need to do Atmos? I mean, now it's, a, it's pretty much a given that the audio system needs to be kept up, you know, with the video. And, you know, at Man VR Labs, we specialize in HDR 
processing. So we're very much kind of at the core of the HDR uh, algorithms and things that's going on. And it's really amazing, allows us to do things that are really next level with the picture. And you couple that with the audio experience and you really bring that commercial cinema experience now to the home. Yeah. No, absolutely. Those are great answers. So kind of going off of that, we talk, touched on Kaleidoscape a little bit during that. Um, so Craig, how about you start off by telling us just a little bit about you know, Kaleidoscape and then how much better of a picture are you going to get from a Blu-ray or a Kaleidoscape versus just a standard streaming service? Sure, sure. So for everybody, you know, Kaleidoscape is known as the ultimate movie player. And it's known for the ultimate movie player because we get those mezzanine files, as I said earlier, directly from the studios. And then we take those and we create what we'll call a kaleidoscape version of that movie in HDR, Dolby Atmos. And then we put that into you know, our movie store, which now has currently about 14,000 titles of all different types of genres and movie ratings and lengths and, and things like that. Um, you know, what we also talk about at Kaleidoscape is the fact that we're help, able to help curate and provide a movie store that allows you to curate your movie, your movie library at home uh, with the best content possible. You know, when it comes to, you know, we hear a lot of conversations about, you know, well, you know, I'm a streamer and, and you know, there's a lot of convenience with that. You know, what I say about that is, you know, again, there is a place for streaming content, absolutely. Um, but Kaleidoscape also does provide, you know, I'll call it that same type of convenience because what you're doing with Kaleidoscape is you're choosing the content that you want to own, that you want to download, that you want to watch. And once you download it, it's resident at your home, on your server, and literally it's very convenient convenient to go into you know your your media room your movie theater and sit down and turn it on and immediately start watching content so um, you know, from a quality standpoint, we always talk about that too, which is, you know, we believe that Kaleidoscape hel helps to elevate all of the components within your system. So, you know, we're at this great show, you're getting to see lots of great technologies, you know, there's aspirations to, you know, have bigger and better um, tools, you know, that you can use to watch content. And, you know, you need to start with a really good source because having all of those great tools, but not having the right content, you know, will certainly impact the experience. So, you know, at Kaleidoscape, we say, you know, we are really the greatest source, the highest fidelity source that will elevate all of the components within your system. So, uh, Richard, the next one's for you. So, Audio Advice has sold a whole host of MadVR envies in high performance theaters. What are the primary advantages of putting a MadVR system just versus buying just a more expensive, better projector? Yeah, no, that, I mean, it's definitely a great question, and Audio Advice has been uh, terrific. They're, they're a great uh, dealer and partner of ours, um, highly skilled at being able to help the consumer dial their system in and, and get to that next level of, of, of you know, video quality. Um, so we, we've also sold a number of units just yesterday uh, and today already as well. So um, what people see when they come to our, our, our exhibit here uh, is that they really get to appreciate the difference that the HDR processing can make. Uh, HDR is really, there's no standard for it at home. So uh, it's kind of up to the individual um, display um, or projector to reproduce that. Um, and we have just an extreme amount of graphics power available in our unit that gives us some flexibility and some raw muscle to be able to do some next level things with AI based algorithms. Um, so the main things are being able to get detail in HDR that is uh, no, no crushing in the brights, no crushing in the blacks, fine detail between the highlights. Um, usually that will tend to get crushed as well. And being able to do things like manage aspect ratios, uh, being able to manage subtitles on scope screens, uh, these are types of things that are all important and go into making just a cohesive experience that is going to be something that makes the system easier to use and be able to really delight the customer. Oh, no, they're awesome. I, I think it's one of those things that people just really don't know about until they go and see it. Um, and, you know, if we have gone up, if anybody has gone up and looked at the GTZ 380 room, there's a Mad VR behind that. And we were watching A Quiet Place yesterday and subtitles moved. People were like, whoa, 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 how, how did you guys do that? I'm like, hey, that's the beauty of a mad VR. Awesome. So, Cody, you test a lot of uh, you know, various video products and are very unbiased. Uh, what advice would you give to somebody that's looking to purchase a new projector currently? <laughs> um, I would say the same thing we've kind of already said. Go 4K. Yep. Go HDR. You know, if you can do dynamic metadata, HDR 10+, Dolby Vision, if you can do that, definitely get it. That'll future-proof you. 
Um, and since these are investments, um, I talked with Patrick earlier today, <laughs> and uh, they have an 8K e-shift technology that they have in their latest projectors. I would say go for that too. That way you're ready for 8K when it comes. And I know everybody's like, oh, 8K, there's, there's no content. There will be. <laughs> Let's be real. It, manufacturers want to continue selling TVs. You know, movies want to still be made. There's things you can do in 8K that you can't do in 4K. And I know a lot of people are like, oh, well, you know, um, you can't see that at normal seating distances. Well, as you go bigger, you can. So if you've got a 220-inch screen in your house, might as well go 8K, right? <laughs> and if you don't have it, why don't you get it, right? Um, so, <laughs> um, so yeah, so I would say, honestly, go 4K, go HDR, get dynamic metadata, and, um, and just get as much technology as you can. Mm -hmm. Patrick, I know you're itching to probably touch on that question as well. What, what do you think people should be looking for if they're, you know, buying their first projector? Uh, well, a JVC, really. <laughs> and, and obviously, I'm biased, but you do, you know, the world is getting bigger. Everyone wants a bigger screen. I mentioned that in the in the first question. And 8K may not be important to you right now, mm -hmm. but eventually you're going to say, all right, no, 120 is plenty big. I mean, a few years ago, everyone, like 120 was mainstream. Now I believe the most commonly sold screen is 133, and that was a, over a two-year difference. They're going to get bigger and bigger and bigger, and that's where you're going to need that extra resolution. So resolution is going to be important. Contrast is important. Yeah. Brightness, in fact, let's, let's move on to the next question, shall we? <laughs> it's a perfect segue. <laughs> All right. So we have found that a lot of manufacturers state lumen levels differently based on calib or calibrations. So we've launched our own projector calculator, as you guys saw last night with Scott, where you can now see how the projector is going to work in your room based off of our measurements with the size of screen, screen gain, everything. So whenever you're looking for a projector, uh, how much emphasis should you put on the total amount of lumens versus the black levels and video processing that are inherent in that projector? So uh, I would be amiss, I would be misguiding you if I did not say that lumens were important. Brightness is important to achieve really beautiful HDR levels, you do need good brightness. But there are other ingredients in the mixture that you really do need to be able to have something that's outstanding. You need great black levels, you need great on-screen resolution, that means putting that image through a beautiful, well-manufactured lens. There's so many little teeny ingredients that go into color gamut. HDR, you have to have a wide color gamut to be able to reproduce beautiful HDR, contrast, all of that. So those are the, all the ingredients. Lumens are important, mm -hmm. absolutely, Nick. But I think if you don't look at the other stuff, I love hot food, I love hot food. But if I just tasted heat and I didn't taste anything in the background, all I've got is, you know, a really hot mouth. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, and as you go up in resolution, naturally you have to put more in front of that light source, and so you're diminishing your resolution otherwise. And so, you know, that's one thing that a lot of people get confused on. You can make a 1080p projector it's mega bright for not very expensive, but to have a native 4K projector, the light source behind that panel has to be really bright. Absolutely. So, awesome. So uh, the next one's for Craig. Um, so over the past few years, we've seen 4K become a standard across pretty much all video systems. Do you think the 8K is going to be doing that in the near future, or will it be uh, yeah, slower? Or do you think that it's going to be as large of a jump? I don't know. I may have to dis disagree with Cody a little bit. So, That's fine. Go ahead. Um, you know, again, I, I, I have such experience in the commercial cinema marketplace, and I know that when we transitioned from 35 millimeter film to digital projection, you know, there was a lot of discussion about, you know, are we going to be able to deliver the same level of experience to moviegoers going from film, which is, you know, a kind of a, a natural substance that has a lot of resolution in it, uh, to digital. And we went through years and years and years of testing uh, comparisons between 35 millimeter and, and digital. And I have to tell you that what we, what we landed on was with Texas Instruments, uh, with their DLP cinema technology, which uses a digital micro mirror device, um, we landed on 2K. And so 90% of all the movie theaters in the world were converted from 35 millimeter film projection to 2K. There were some 4K systems uh, that were manufactured by Sony, frankly, at the time. Um, but that was a different transmissive type of technology versus the reflective technology of TI. Um, and there were a number of major circuits that chose to go 4K because they wanted to be ahead of the curve. Mm -hmm. uh, even though the studios were only really mastering 
content at the 2K level. And there was just a small percentage of, of theaters that could actually play back native 4K. Um, you know, I think that you know, from a commercial standpoint, you know, this marketplace is connected to that uh, industry as well, and obviously the studios. Kaleidoscape, you know, we get that mezzanine file from the studios, and you know, most of the time, you know, that file is HDR, which is great these days, Dolby Atmos, and has all the metadata in it. We add additional metadata to it. Um, you know, I just don't understand. I don't see the industry moving quickly towards 8K. Uh, unless the Hollywood studios, you know, have a, an economic reason to actually do it. And one of the economic reasons to do that would be obviously to drive more revenue at box office and the additional windows that happen after the commercial cinema marketplace. Um, and it will cost them more money to uh, master and distribute 8K bigger files um, um, to maintain that, that resolution and that quality. So. Um, you know, again, I, I'm not sure that I see 8K, you know, right over the horizon. I think eventually, <laughs> Cody, you're right. I mean, it's going to happen, right? But I think that we still have a lot of time to enjoy, you know, the technology that we currently have that's available in the marketplace. I mean, there's really great stuff in the marketplace, and uh, certainly having the right content helps that. Yeah, but wouldn't it be? I'm sorry, my uh, friend. <laughs> but wouldn't it be great if there was a company out there that could take <laughs> your beautiful native 4K HDR content yes. and turn it into true 8K, like Mad VR? Or there's another company out there called JVC that also has the ability <laughs> to do that. Yeah. Um, but it, it takes the content, and both of us are doing a, a different kind of pixel shifting. It's it's very very different than anything we've ever done before, and every single pixel is addressable. So it, it's a new technology. We both share something similar. So uh, you can take your 4K content, throw it on 170 inch screen, and not be worried about corner resolution or any of that other stuff. Mm -hmm. Sounds like a win-win-win. <laughs> yeah. Good partnership, right? Yeah. 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 <laughs> because, like Patrick says, like the the, the Mavir Envy Extreme is will upscale and output at 8K. Mm -hmm. um, so we can, for example, take whether it's 1080p or 4K and upscale it to 8K using our proprietary algorithms and then feed it to an 8K display or projector like in JVC's case uh, for native input at 8K. So really quick, you know, one of the big things that I always hear is at what point is resolution going to get in indistinguishable? Correct. You know, so people are saying, oh, well, you know, if I go to 8K, am I going to see that much of a difference between 4K? Any of you guys have opinions on that? So I get that question actually quite often on my channel. And so one thing that I typically tell people, it really, part of it comes down to how close are you to your display, whether it's a projector, TV, yeah. but also how big is your image? Because the reality, if you've got a 55 inch TV, 8K, I'm not sure you're gonna be able to see that much of a difference between 8K and 4K. In my case, I've got a 150 inch diagonal screen and I'm sitting nine feet from it. Would I benefit from 8K? Possibly, you know, so the bigger you go, the more resolution I think really, really matters. Um, so 8K is, is on the horizon. I think, I, I agree with Craig, I think it's going to be a little while before that's going to be mainstream. My thought is get something that you can enjoy now because it's always going to be evolving. It's always going to be changing. There's always going to be a new platform. And, you know, so if you're just hesitant, well, I'll wait till then. Well, if you wait till then, there's something else going to be. Yeah. You know, so get what you can afford now, get something that's gonna meet your needs now, and then when that next technology comes, at that point, consider maybe upgrading to that. Awesome, great well, answer, guys. Before we yeah. go, yeah, go, I ahead. just wanna put one more flag down for this 8K thing. <laughs> uh, but no, what I would say um, is, so my kids are younger, right? My, my youngest is four. And, um, and one of the things that, you know, all new parents have thought about is they wanna capture their children, right? And so being able to record in the highest resolution you can for your kids is important, right? With our phones, our phones are, you know, Samsung's got the S21 that'll shoot 8K. And people are like, oh, well, we don't have the content. Well, eventually you will, right? And storage is also becoming cheaper. So that is one reason to shoot in 8K. I'm not saying everybody's becoming a parent tomorrow or anything like that, <laughs> but you do start thinking about that kind of stuff when you have kids. You wanna record in the highest resolution so when they're older and they see it, it actually looks good. Because, I mean, we thought 1080p was, excellent you know 10 years ago and it was but now you look at something you know in 4k versus 1080p and you're like 
oh, it's good. It's a little soft, but it's good. You know. <laughs> yeah. So in ten years, we might be saying the same thing about AK. But I'm done. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> no, great point. Uh, most of my AK videos of my dog. Does that count? So, yeah. Uh, yeah. Whatever. Uh, <laughs> I love those. By the way. <laughs> I love those. I'm on your Insta, so I just, uh, yeah. Yeah, watch just, keep, yeah, just keep watching. <laughs> so uh, Patrick, in most theaters that we do, we put in two. Uh, you have two four to one screen. Not all of them, but most. Um, so you know, one of the popular questions that I get are, you know, how do we switch aspect ratios? So we go two, two four to one for those of you who don't know. That's widescreen, and then sixteen by nine, which is you know, definitely not nine. Nine. It's, it's wide. So how do we switch between those, and what are the advantages and disadvantages between those? So again, I'm going to touch on that VR in just a second, but um, and and this is a very deep question. I'm going to try to keep it light. You can buy really wide screens that are a little bit thinner, or you can do 16 by 9, which is most TV content, or you can do some crazy aspect ratio, which is Netflix, that does whatever they want, whatever time they want. <laughs> but um, when you put it on the screen, and you want to be able to change from one to the other, if you have a wide screen, if your projector has motorized lens shift and presets, not all of them do, but all the JVC DILA projectors do, then you can shift between 6, 7 by 9, blow that out when you're watching 235, 24, or whatever content you want, and make it fill the entire screen. Mm -hmm. That's one way to do it. Yep. There's another way to do it using an anamorphic lens. It's not inexpensive, but there are benefits to it, for sure. Using an anamorphic lens, you're gonna gain a little bit of brightness. It's because it's a really beautiful, well-made lens assembly. It's larger. It's going to give us a little bit of brightness. I believe it's on the fold of 10%. I don't, don't, don't quote me on that, but I think it's right around 10%. <laughs> and it'll change with the right preset. There are projectors out there that have presets for anamorphic lenses. And when you do that, it will automatically lens shift it for the proper image for that anamorphic lens. That's great. It does take a little bit of time to set up. They are fairly expensive. The final way is if you do something like the Mad VR, which is an incredible piece of product, and it'll do the scaling for you automatically. It'll stretch, physically stretch the image without too much compression. Maybe you could follow up with that. Yes, yeah, sure. So, um, you know, we get this question all the time. Should I be a 16 by nine screen? Should I be a 240 screen? And there's a lot of complexities that actually come along with having a scope screen, meaning something like 235 or 240. You have to manage aspect ratios, you have to manage black bars, you have to manage projector zoom, and if you go from like the Apple TV menu back to a scope, like a widescreen movie, and back to Apple TV menu, you have to keep changing the lens shift. So something where the maybe our MV does is it allows you to automatically, the, essentially you set your lens once and you'll never touch it again. And then the MV provides what's called constant image height, also known as CIH. And that ensures that the image is always on the screen and fit the right way. And then you can layer in things such as uh, our nonlinear stretch to get rid of the black bars. Um, black bars are, are not bad at all, especially if you have a high contrast projector like the JVC. Um, we, you know, then the black bars are, are, are there. But for some people that say, hey, uh, you know, I've got this real expensive screen. I want to fill this whole thing up. You know, you can use like the, our, our nonlinear stretch that will share geometric load across both axes. Mm -hmm. And it looks really, really good. It's like very hard to tell that there's anything going on with it. And all of a sudden you have this image that's great. Some people use it for movies, um, but a lot of people also uh, use it for sports. Yeah, yeah, and I think that there is a lot of different use cases for each one. Obviously, lens shift and lens memory being the most affordable, and morphic lens if you need that extra touch of brightness, and then obviously video processing is a fantastic option as long as you've got the brightness for it. So yeah, I mean, if you guys ever have questions on that, feel free to call us because we can do the calculations for you to see what you really need to do and which one's best for you. Um, but yeah, awesome. So uh, Riggs, it's kind of on the same note. Um, so most theater I design, one of the most common questions are what size screen do I do? In what which we just touched on, what aspect ratio do I do? So what are your thought, pro what's your thought process between describing screen size and aspect ratio? Yeah, and it's a great question and it comes up all the time. And basically our advice is to go as big as you can, of mm -hmm. course, because some people say, oh, that's too big. But like anything, over time you realize, oh, I should have gotten bigger. Like how many people here have bought a TV and they've been like, Oh, they bring it home and they're like, uh oh, I hope I didn't get something too big. And like a week later, they're like, should have gone for the 85 inch. You know? That's right. And so, you know, our advice is always go as big as you can. You are constrained oftentimes by the room, uh, particularly the height. So if you have like a seven foot ceiling, 
Um, you know, you can only have the screen so high. You know, you don't want it on the floor where you're going to be hitting it with the vacuum. And you don't want it buttoned up necessarily right up against the ceiling. So when you leave, you know, a foot and a half or two feet off the ground and you leave maybe six inches from the ceiling, you know, you're, that's kind of defines your maximum height. And then the width goes, you know, scope screens. And when I say scope screens, I mean widescreen, something beyond a regular HDTV 16 by 9, but something that's like a 235 or 240 aspect ratio. Um, by far, those are, are the most immersive experience that you can create in home cinema. Absolutely. Um, a, a common misconception, and I run into this with my friends as well, um, they say, oh, well, I only, I'm mainly watching sports, or I'm mainly watching TV, and all that content 16 by 9, and so I don't want to go with a, a wide screen for when I'm watching movies, because then my screen is smaller for when I'm watching sports. And then I, I say, well, but it's not. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure what the disconnect is. But at the end of the day, go with the largest 16 by 9 screen that you can fit, but then go wider on each side to get to that 235 or 240 aspect ratio. And then you can really enjoy the best of both worlds. So when you're watching 16 by 9, yes, you have black bars, or you can fill it in with, with stretch or you could use a masking screen if you want to close it in like that. But when you go to watch a movie at 235 or 240 compared to what you would watch at 16 by nine, it is really a mind blowing experience, the difference. It is the single, I believe, it is among the single most important thing when you decide what projector, uh, what size screen, what size components, what all that stuff, probably the most important thing because you're gonna be living with that screen a long time. Yeah, you know that's why we really advise going widescreen and having that immersive experience. Yeah, well, one thing everyone can do is if you go down to the Sony and JVC rooms that are downstairs, one room has a 240 to one, and with which is 140 inch, and then one has a 123 inch 16 by nine, both stored film screens, and you can kind of go see the difference between the two. Obviously, you know the 16 by nine, we don't have quite as much clearance; it's just slightly taller, but you can kind of see what we're talking about. Decide which one's probably the most immersive for your yeah. room. Nick, can I piggyback off that just a little bit of what Richard was saying? Yeah. So in my, when I was developing my room, I didn't want just a big TV. I mean, mm -hmm. we all have a 16 by nine, maybe in the living room, in the bedroom, that's what we're used to. When you walk into your theater room, especially if you've got a dedicated room, I wanted to create something that was different. When you walk in, you're like, whoa, dude, this thing is wall to wall. <laughs> my room's 13 feet wide, the screen is 12 like 12 and a half. <laughs> so, I mean, it's almost wall to wall. So you get a different perspective and talking about the immersiveness, when you sit down and, and it's just visually right in front of you, that's an incredible experience. And going from, you know, using, I've got a JVC NX7, so the older version, I have the lens shit. I have what they call the poor man's anamorphic setup, <laughs> you know, because I just zoom in and fill up my screen. But when I have guests over to my home, and you know, the menu's in 16 by nine, we don't have the fancy VR to go ahead and do that for me. So once we hit play, you know, now you've got gray bars on the side, gray bars on the top and the bottom, and you hit the lens shift, and it starts zooming in, they go, whoa. That's <laughs> cool. That is cool. Yeah. So having that, that large screen, a buddy of mine told me too, go as big as you can, because here's the reality. You can always mask it down if you need, if you just say that, man, that is just way too big, you can always build some masking around it to make it smaller. If you buy a small screen, it's a lot harder to go larger. Yeah. And, and you, just to you, add to everybody's yeah. comment, um, you know, at Kaleidoscape, we have over 14,000 titles, and there is a huge percentage of those titles that are in scope, yeah. right? Because mm -hmm. guess what? Directors in Hollywood, they wanted to provide the most immersive, widescreen uh, experience. And so, uh, in the commercial cinema marketplace, they typically go as wide as they possibly can because they want that content, they want that screen and the projection system to basically fill that screen as wide as possible. And you know, the, the trick with IMAX is you know, they actually move the audience as close as they possibly can to that screen to create that, that immersive <laughs> experience and fill your peripheral vision with content. Yeah. And so yeah, I'm, I'm all on that board with you know, big screen, as wide as you can go. Yeah, and that's why I like having multiple rows in the theater because everyone can, you know, if you don't like sitting super close to a screen, you can move back a little bit and, you know, it's not quite as overwhelming. Or if you do uh, you know, lens memory and you have 16 by 9, which you want a little bit more, a little bit wider viewing angle and sit closer, you can sit mm -hmm. closer. So, 
That's perfect. Well, that's a great transition over the next question for yeah. Michael. Uh, so whenever you're looking for an acoustically transparent screen, what are some of the considerations that customers should be aware of? Yeah, so for the most, I'm not an expert on acoustic transparent screens. Again, I wanted to go as wide as I could. And by doing that, I knew that I would be able to effectively place all of my speakers behind it. And I can tell you by having a center channel directly behind the screen mm -hmm. is huge because that's where the action is. And that's where all the dialogue is. You know, some people have estimated there's like 80% of content that comes from the center channel. So by moving that center channel yeah, up from right. the bottom to right there, it adds some more immersiveness to that experience. And so for the most part, there's a couple of types of, of uh, screens. You can do a, a perforated screen where it basically has little pinholes in it. Um, there's also a weave. I reached out to Seymour when I was building my system and they recommended the weave because I was nine foot from 150 inch. Mm. They're like, okay, um, that's really a little bit closer than what we recommend. I think they recommend like 10 or a little bit further, but I'm like, man, I'm halfway blind. I will never see that <laughs> weave anyway, so it's not a big deal. Um, but I don't see the weave at all, but I love having an acoustic transparent screen. Um, so you're gonna need to kind of figure out what works best for you, you know? My understanding, the perforated or even the micro perforated is going to give you more brightness um, because basically there's more surface area to reflect the light back to your, your sitting position. Um, but when I look at my screen, it's still plenty bright enough for me, even though some of that you know, light is being spilled through my cabinet or through that screen. Um, so that's one thing to think about. Some people wonder, you know, is, you know, does that impact the... Um, you know, the audio aspect of it. These screen manufacturers, Stewart is here at the show. Uh, we've got um, Seymour is here mm -hmm. at the show. So you can go in there and listen. You decide for yourself, can I hear the dialogue? Does it sound amazing? And it absolutely does. And your room correction software will, you know, basically compensate for any attenuation in the top end that that's, you know, losing. Um, so definitely there's a lot of different factors out there do your research, figure out, you know, do I need to go with a perf so I can get, you know, uh, a brighter image? Um, the other thing, too, with those two, it determines, and Nick, maybe you can share some more information on this, but one of those, I believe the perf, you have to be, is it further It's a little back? bit further away, so the sound's going to travel, it's going to pass through a woven screen a lot easier. Yeah. So, like you said, the screen gain is going to be a big trade-off there. Uh, but, you know, a, a, an acoustically transparent screen, it gives you a unique opportunity, especially with a false wall, yeah. to a acoustically treat your front wall because that sound's gonna be able to pass right through. And so you put you know, some type of dampening or acoustic fabric right there, or acoustic fabric, acoustic uh, panels right there, and you actually just have one giant acoustic panel in the front of your room mm -hmm. to block those axial reflections. So it helps in a lot of different ways. Instead of just putting a big solid screen up there, it's gonna cause more reflection. But no, awesome. If I, if I can just before yeah. we move on, um, just to tie into what Michael was saying, um, the imaging, as you mentioned, is very important. Um, having the center speaker right behind the screen, so when the actors are talking, you can, can actually see the imaging, like it's, it's actually right coming at you. Because most actors on screen when they're talking are in the center of the image. But what also is an interesting point to tie this into what we were talking about just prior to this, with the aspect ratio control, the reason why acoustic screens are popular as they are is because when you start planning on having this ultra wide screen and you go 240, all of a sudden the challenge becomes is, wait, where am I supposed to put my left and right speaker? Oh, yeah. Right? And so that's a, just an important point I wanted to tie back in because when you do, or if you do make the decision to go with a 235 or 240 screen, all of a sudden your speakers are pretty much, pro unless you have, them, you have a giant wall, and if you've done your job of going as big as, as we recommend you go, you're going to realize, like, wait a minute, that only leaves you know, maybe a half a foot, like Michael's saying, this whole front wall is basically screen. So the, having the acoustic the transparent screen is the key to being able to get that wide screen and immersive experience because your speakers now have to be behind the screen. There's no room for them otherwise. Yeah. Cool. Just one other thing too. It looks cool. Look <laughs> <laughs> at Michael's videos on youth, man. He oh. actually shows the lights, you know, on his speakers behind his screen, turns off the lights in the room, turns on the speaker lights, and bam. It just looks <laughs> oh, cool. That's cool. Yeah. Anyway, oh, yeah. sorry. 
Right. Oh, no, it's so cool because, I mean, false wall design is, is, is a conversation that I could probably talk about for an hour, but, you know, there's different ways to do acoustically transparent screens. You can put it right over in-wall speakers. You can build out your wall. You can take the screen, jut it out further if you want to create some extra space. So there's a lot of ways to do it and make sure it's black behind your screen. And if you, if you haven't seen Michael set up on his YouTube channel, you're going to be impressed. He did it all himself. There's a lot of hard work, and it is really one of the more magnificent handbuilt theaters I've ever seen. <laughs> Perfect. Right. So uh, I'm going to switch gears just a little bit. Um, Rick, so we, we discussed Mad VR and all the technology behind it. Uh, so what role is like machine learning and AI playing in video processing, and what can we expect to see on the road? And also, for the people who don't know, can just explain machine learning uh, I know that's an yeah. easy task. Explain machine learning in two seconds. <laughs> yeah. So just to keep it really simple, you know, machine learning is a basis. Uh, it's it's a it's really come of age in the last kind of decade or so, and it's rapidly expanding more. And you're seeing more and more machine learning things happening. It's a way where you kind of create models where the computer can learn to think on its own and make decisions. And so there is something called AI training. Um, where you're feeding it, like a, in the case of imaging or recognizing, let's say you're going to try to recognize animals, make a computer be able to look at it. So you may be feeding it all sorts of uh, photos and images of all different things and teaching what it is. And then all of a sudden it kind of develops this network, like a neural network, where it can figure out things on its own. And so we apply AI um, to our product, we're the only dedicated video processor that has AI-based upscaling, downscaling, managing. Um, there's a lot of algorithms and development to, to your other point. And what this allows you to do is really create next generation algorithms like upscaling. Like when people look at our upscaling, they're like, oh my god, you know, that looks like native 4K. Like how is that possible? Um, you know, just as like a side note, we have an AI-based algorithm um, that is able to take, in, in some cases, um, the studios create like a, a 1080p uh, content from a 4K master. Mm -hmm. And so they actually will downscale their 4K to create like a 1080p Blu-ray. Mm -hmm. And so if someone's playing that content, we have an AI-based algorithm that can actually reverse that and almost make it identical back to the 4K. So those are the types of algorithms and stuff. Uh, as far as the future, you're going to see more and more things um, coming down the road, like um, uh, dynamic tone mapping, that's AI-based. Um, we have plans for what we call um, grain agnostic sharpening, uh, upscaling, detail enhancement. So just imagine in real time, you know, we all know what film grain is, right? You kind of see it and it's not like crystal clear. It's like designed to look like film. So there's what they call grain, like a little bit of noise intentionally in these images or, or it comes from the actual uh, the film itself. So we're actually able to remove the film grain completely and then do our upscaling, detail enhancement, sharpening those types of things on the original content without affecting the grain and then take that grain and layer it right back oh, on wow. top <laughs> so that it looks natural and it still looks like film but we without doing that then you're just sharpening and adding detail to grain and that doesn't look good so these are the types of algorithm and things that are becoming more and more possible as the gpu power uh and as the the technology and modern day hardware that's used in the man vr mv allows us to really tap into these ai based capabilities to take the video processing and algorithms to a whole new generation level. Wow. i'd love to provide you with um, a copy of lawrence of arabia a film from 1962 that was recently rescanned in 4K, uh, available on Kaleidoscape Store. And I mean, there's film grain. You can see it, right? For the lovers of you know film, and that film grain really you know provides sort of this like love story. Um, but I'd love to have you take a look at that and see what Mad VR could do with it. Oh, that would be great. Yeah. That would be a fun project. Yeah, I'm sure we'll take you up on that. It's three hours and 47 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> How many seconds? <laughs> well, let's go take over the JVC room and let's watch it real quick. All right. <laughs> awesome. Well, guys, that's really all the questions we had. Now, what I want to do is I want to take it over to some audience questions. So if you guys have any questions for us, we have a microphone over there on the right side, my right side, your left. Uh, and yeah, we'd love to hear some questions from you guys. So, oh, 
and don't be shy. I know. Not to put anybody on the spot, but you yeah. gotta get up, yeah. walk yeah, across the whole room while everyone looks at you, <laughs> and then get in front of a microphone. And well, in the meantime, it's low guys, pressure. If you guys do want to see what AI, you know, upscaling looks like, uh, a fun little anecdote. There is a. So I'm sure you guys know what Rick Rowling is. Rick Astley, Never Gonna Give You Up. Yeah. They actually took that mo that that music video and upsampled it into 4K and I, I, somebody clicked on it or sent it to me and I was like, why is this so clear? <laughs> I was like, I, was like uh, I get the joke, but why is it so clear? That's funny. Awesome. Yeah, what questions you got? All right, thanks for the panel. This has been great. What does the panel think about with a home user TV projector using the display you know, out of the box, maybe it's internal optimizer system versus hiring a professional calibrator to come in? And then part B to that, I understand for SDR, HD, there's well-known standards, but are there standards for calibrating HDR, 4K, UHD stuff? I love this question. Uh, uh, that's me, I guess. I know uh, you're so, um, yes, there are, there are other standards that are out there. HDR and, and SD is the most common. JVC takes a different approach than some of the other projector manufacturers, and we have the ability to do a, a rudimentary color management calibration for your home theater. What I mean by that is you download software, free software from our website, you put up a, a photo device that takes an image off the screen, and that projector will calibrate itself as best it can with the knowledge that it has to, the, to your room. So now you've got something that's really calibrated to you. That, in addition to our theater optimizer, where you put in the data from the, the screen, if you don't want to do that auto calibration, we, we'll take data from your screen gain, screen size, and even screen material. And we'll try to enhance the image just based off that information that we reproduce in our labs. So that's definitely one way to do it. The other way to do it is to hire an ISF calibrator. And we believe that we can get you close, really, really close. Hiring an ISF calibrator to come to your house, make sure all the lights are the way they need to be, which is none, and then really make sure everything's set up properly and going through every single color over several hours is another way to do it to make sure you have the most accurate, flattest response possible. So I, I love ISF cal calibrated projectors, but there are, there are alternatives for yeah. sure. I think one thing too is I have a friend of mine that he has his own equipment. He's got several thousand dollars in light meters and he's able to calibrate his own, but he says he calibrates his, it's a bulb based projector, uh, JVC, but he calibrates his every 400 hours mm -hmm. because I guess the calibration changes as your bulb gets dimmer. Now the good thing with the new laser projectors, they don't really dim over time for the most part. So I think my thought is you're probably gonna get a lot more money and value if you wanna hire a professional calibrator on maybe a laser projector versus maybe a bulb because over time you're gonna to need to do it again and again. So either learn how to do it yourself, buy the calibration, um, you know, the light meters, use JVC's internal, um, what is it called, Patrick? The the calibration yeah. software? Yeah. It's called Calibrates. Okay, so calibration <laughs> we, didn't, we didn't get fancy. Right? I, thought, I thought there was a fancy name for it, but apparently not. You know, um, I, I'm sorry, were you there? Yeah. Um, so, you know, you bring up an interesting point. Um, when you're calibrating a bulb projector, it can actually be tricky because the brightness level during the calibration can change. And so a lot of the calibration uh, reference point is based on like the brightest white and the color temperature of white. And so you're doing a calibration that takes an hour or two and just the fluctuation in the bulb over that time is enough to kind of make the gamma and the, throw the kind of calibration off. Um, to the point about calibration more often, um, you're exactly right. You know, uh, having like the new JVCs with the, the laser-based lamp, you have a much more stable calibration platform when you start, when you finish, and then that calibration may last for a few thousand hours, maybe even longer without that. Um, so one of the features that the MadVR Envy has is we connect with third-party third party calibration software products to create um, a, what's called a 3D LUT and a 1D LUT, which is basically fancy talk for, uh, it puts patterns up on the screen and allows the, the ISF calibrator to create this massive color like um, you know Patrick was, was mentioning. And they can get the accuracy down to really pinpoint uh, accuracy both in grayscale gamma and color balance. 
Yeah. I've got one more wrench to throw into this. Um, <laughs> JVC prides itself on the fact that you take our projector out of the box, you do panel alignment, and you go. It's great if you do the calibration, it's great if you do all of that. But, and you need to do, by the way, everyone, if you're not doing panel alignment on your projectors, shame on you. Everyone <laughs> needs to do it at least once in the beginning. But our projectors look great out of the box, we're super happy with that. That being said, everybody's projectors look pretty darn good. Yeah. And if any of the major name projectors look pretty darn good out of the box. People have tended to dial that in, though it's not really outlandish. Like back in the day, you'd have to worry about super hot red or some, the super faded blue. So it, all of it's getting a lot better and there's no reason why you can't, while you're waiting to calibrate it or if you wanna hold off, yeah. fire the thing up, Jesus. watch it. Yeah, I mean, every projector here is uncalibrated. Uh, every, yeah, pretty much everyone's fair of the box. Can you go to? Oh, I mean, the only other thing I would mention is that, you know, even, you know, Hollywood colorists, they have reference monitors that are, you know, 43 inches, $10,000. I mean, it's ridiculously priced compared to, you know, what we can buy in the consumer market. But they calibrate that to make sure things look the way they're supposed to look. Because when we're watching movies, watching TV, they've spent time to make a color make you feel a certain way. You know, if you've got a, a gritty drama, it's probably going to be a colder look. If you've got a warm, happy story, it's going to be a warmer, yellower look, right? And that's what we want our TVs and our projection systems to emulate that, right? Because most of the people in here are spending a lot of money on their equipment. So spending a couple extra hundred bucks on a calibration is not really that big of a deal when you've spent, you know, $5,000 on your, you know, your projector and then you got to get a screen on top of that or whatever, right? So that's yeah. my little two cents. Write down your presets. <laughs> Oh, yes. If somebody calibrates that projector, go through every single menu and write down your presets. Yep. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. All right, we got another question. Yeah, what are your thoughts about um, short throw projectors versus uh, conventional distance projectors? There's any differences? What are they? There's yeah. a lot of differences. Yeah, there's there. definitely yes. some differences. I know I've, <laughs> I've reviewed quite a few. I really like, I think the ultra short throw projector, is that what you're talking about, the ultra short throws? So the ultra short throw projectors have their place. I think they're fantastic for somebody that wants to add big screen, immersive, you know, image in especially like a living room environment. Because I can tell you as beautiful as my JVC and X7 is, if I put it in my living room with massive windows, it just, it's not going to look that great because it's going to be really washed out. So with the ultra short throw projector, you've got that light source really close to your screen. So you can get a really nice image. Now, not all of those are created equal. There's definitely some projectors that are kind of leading the, the way in that. And they can produce a really, really nice image. But I think there's just, um, there's definitely some limitations there. If you have a room that you can control with lighting, pretty good light control room, 100% any day of the week, I would tell you, go with a regular tr traditional projector long throw, whatever you want to call it. Um, but if you've got a room that is kind of a multi-purpose room, living room, a lot of ambient light, ultra short throw can be a really, really great option for you. And those screens that they sell the ultra short throws with are ambient light rejecting and they accept, Correct. It, they accept light from a certain direction. Yes. There are great screen manufacturers out there. I'm not going to point out any specific one, but there are great screen manufacturers out there that have really perfected this technology and have taken it to the next level. I live in Florida. I, we both live in Florida. Yeah, yeah. We, I have big windows down both sides of my great room where my projector is. I have a black diamond screen. It projects tons of ambient yeah. light. Full daylight? No way. Not going to work. Mm -hmm. I have no light control in my windows. But outside of that, there's technology out there that you can jet that Stuart makes really good sure. new screen material too. Really good. So there's stuff out there that can kind of help you with that. But And the other thing I'd like to add about short throw is if you're a perfectionist, don't have dogs or cats, then you're good to go. Because if somebody bumps into that, yeah, and just a little shifts, bit, yeah. it, right. and it takes a good minute and some patience to get that lined up just perfectly again. So uh, if you're expecting a lot of activity around the projector, it might be something you don't want to think about. Yeah, yeah. Another challenge is where do you put the center channel? Yeah. That's a, one that's of the a big things. One. Like, okay, where am I going to put my center channel? You know, you can't put it above it because that's where the light source is. Do you put it below it? Well, now you're raising the projector up higher, so now your screen's up higher. So there's definitely some challenges there. Um, one thing I want to throw a plug for Seymour, uh, they announced at the show, how many of y'all went to the Seymour room that they had? It's, um, what's the, the brand? Theory Audio. 
Wolf, all, it, Wolf and Theory are both in there. Yeah, so incredible room, but they just announced, I had somebody ask me just literally probably three days ago, Michael, is there a company that makes an ultra short throw um, ambient light rejection screen that is acoustic transparent? And I'm like, no, they don't, that technology doesn't that. exist. It does today. Seymour announced that at the show, so definitely go check that out. That's great. They've got their speakers um, directly behind, three identical speakers behind an ambient light rejection screen, so that's pretty cool. So the technology's changing, it's getting better and better, so, yeah. Yeah. And one thing I would just think about is, you know, there's a lot of processing behind getting a light source that's, you know, obviously these are very close, these projectors are ultra short throw right there under it. Because that's the light wants to travel in a pattern like that, and so right. you have to have it and stretch it out like that. Mm -hmm. So typically, the image consistency used to be a lot worse from bottom to top, different areas. Um, so that's they've gotten a lot better. Obviously, the LS500 out there looks great. Um, so they have gotten better. The other thing is it's a lot harder to do a widescreen format or scope screen like okay. we were talking about because you can't really use lens memory on that. Right. And so it's pretty much just manual movements. Yeah. Awesome. So I think we got time for about one more. Go ahead. Yes, thank you. I, I'm 76 years old. I've had two new cataracts surgeries this year, and I have bilateral hearing aids. Things look different on my home theater. <laughs> Sound different. So could audio advice send someone out and help me adjust what I have to optimize it? Or do you offer that service? And about how expensive is it? Well, you know, I, I don't know about the calibration side of things, um, you know, for, for video and that, because it's really hard to quantify. Now, in terms of audio, uh, you know, whenever we go to an audio audiologist, probably talk about this more off, but, you know, if you know what hearing range you were having difficulty with, you can make a custom curve to kind of compensate for that. But as for video, I don't know the process behind that as much. Do you make home visits, though, to help me? Do all these things you're talking talk, about? Talk to our team and we can, uh, we can, we can see what they have. I'm, I'm not sure off the top of my head. Awesome. Uh, absolutely. Well, guys, this has been a blast. And, uh, you know, everybody in the crowd, I really want to thank everyone from the bottom of my heart and my team's heart for coming out here. This has been a huge event for us and we couldn't be more excited. And